Hello, this is Professor McDermott. Well, I must be getting very long-winded in my old age because uh, we weren't able to finish the Gathering Storm lecture in class. Um, so here is the rest of the lecture. I'll pick up where we left off. Now, we have been talking about um, the rise of the Republican Party as the official opposition party to the Democrats ushering in the third party system, Republicans versus Democrats which of course uh, is the party system that we're still in. Um, and when we talk about the rise of the Republican Party, uh, of course we must talk about the rise of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and I'm sure you know that uh, Abraham Lincoln was an attorney from uh, Illinois. Uh, he was a politician in Illinois, not a real successful politician actually. Uh, he had been elected to the st state legislature. Um, he served one term in the United States Congress as a member of the Whig Party in the House of Representatives from 1846 to 1848. But um, otherwise, he was uh, really not a household name uh, throughout the country until in 1858 he decided to challenge Senator Stephen Douglas the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, for Douglas's seat in the United States Senate from Illinois. And so Lincoln and Douglas toured around Illinois, uh, debating each other, giving speeches uh, in different cities. And um, these have become some of the most famous political uh, speeches in American history, um, including Lincoln's uh, really very important speech called The House Divided. Um, and uh, here's a little excerpt from Lincoln's uh, House Divided speech. He said, quoting from the New Testament, the Bible, he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, north as well as south." End quote. Well, what is Lincoln saying here? <clears throat> He's saying that one of two things has to happen. Um, either slavery will be eliminated um, throughout the country eventually, or the advocates of slavery, the pro-slavery people, will succeed uh, in getting slavery introduced into all the territories and reintroduced into the North. And um, that possibility, uh, of course, had become a live option because of the Dred Scott decision. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1857, which seemed to imply that um, that slavery could be legalized uh, anywhere and that Congress had no power to stop that. Um, and so when Lincoln raised that specter of slavery being reinstituted in the North, he really struck a lot of fear into the hearts of Northerners. Uh, most Northerners at this point in time still didn't care that much about African Americans or their rights, but um, they really didn't want, for a number of reasons, slavery to be reintroduced um, in the North. So this was a very clever strategy on Lincoln's part to, to mention that possibility. Um, however, it, it should be said that um, Lincoln's strategy and the Republican strategy before the Civil War was not to try to get slavery abolished in the South. Um, Lincoln said many times he had no intention of trying to abolish it in the states where it already existed. The Republican Party's agenda was simply to restrict the spread of slavery, to keep it from spreading into the territories, to keep it from expanding. And they hoped that by uh, confining slavery to the states where it already existed, um, that eventually it would become um, unprofitable and that it would uh, die out. So that was uh, Lincoln's agenda and the Republican Party's platform. Well, um, Lincoln lost the Senate election to Stephen Douglas. Uh, he was outvoted in the Illinois legislature. 
Uh, at that time, the legislatures, state legislatures, chose U.S. senators, not the voters themselves. But um, he did uh, become nationally famous when the Lincoln-Douglas debates were published. Uh, and many people for the first time read his ideas. And of course, he became a leading contender for the Republican presidential nomination in 1860. Well, on to... Uh, a very different type of anti-slavery uh, leader, John Brown, John Brown. And <laughs> if you look at this picture of John Brown, uh, I think you can, you can tell a lot about um, the kind of person that he was. If you look at that determined glare, uh, that very self-righteous look, the fact that he's uh, raising his hand swearing uh, eternal hostility to slavery. Um, John Brown was an extraordinary man. Uh, he believed that uh, God had given him the mission of putting an end to slavery in the United States of America, and he intended to do that by um, any means necessary. Um, John Brown was a fanatic you could say, like William Lloyd Garrison, but unlike Garrison, he was an armed and dangerous um, fanatic, and he showed that for the first time in 1856, when he and his uh, family moved to Kansas during um, the Bleeding Kansas episode, the rush to get settlers into Kansas, uh, to win the vote on whether slavery would be permitted. And when pro-slavery uh, vigilantes invaded from Missouri and destroyed the city of Lawrence, Kansas, which was an anti-slavery town, um, John Brown decided to take matters into his own hands uh, to get revenge. And one night he and his sons rode out and they kidnapped uh, five uh, pro-slavery settlers, dragged them out of their homes, took them out into the forest, and hacked them to death with swords. Um, that was the kind of man that John Brown um, was. He, he really intended to put an end to slavery, and he didn't mind using any, um, any methods in order to achieve uh, that goal. Well, Brown uh, had to go underground for a while after this um, incident, but when he reemerged um, a couple years later, um, he entered negotiations with... Uh, six wealthy anti-slavery uh, men in the Northeast, and he convinced them to finance um, his newest idea for putting an end um, to slavery. And uh, so we call these men the Secret Six. Well, what was John Brown's plan? Um, there was a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. An arsenal is a place where uh, weapons are stored, guns, gunpowder, and so forth. Um, and so the U.S. Army had an arsenal there at Harper's Ferry. Brown's idea was uh, to get a, a small military force together and um, capture the arsenal at Harper's Ferry and then take the guns and distribute them to the slaves in Virginia and encourage them to rise up in revolt. And uh, Brown believed that uh, once this happened, that slaves all over the South would seize the opportunity to revolt, and the slave system would be put to, um, to an end. Um, it was something of a crazy plan, <laughs> um, but it does show that um, by this point in time, especially after the Dred Scott decision, um, abolitionists in the North were becoming impatient, and uh, were becoming convinced that they were not getting anywhere through the political process or through persuasion, and uh, that maybe it was time to use more violent methods um, to try to bring about an end um, to slavery. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this plan uh, <laughs> went down to defeat largely because of the attitude of the slaves themselves. Uh, Brown did capture the arsenal and he did try to distribute the weapons to the slaves, but understandably um, the slaves were not that enthusiastic about getting involved in this in this plan. 
um, because there there was really too much at stake for them. They knew that if they were defeated and captured, that they would be tortured and executed in horrible ways, and simply uh, couldn't risk that. Um, and so Brown failed to win over uh, the slaves as he had hoped, and um, a U.S. Army colonel named Robert E. Lee um, showed up with a detachment of troops, surrounded the arsenal, um, captured Brown and his uh, supporters. Uh, Brown was put on trial for treason, found guilty, and he was executed on December the 2nd, 1859. Uh, but the the life and the death of John Brown really uh, were another factor that helped to drive the North and the South um, farther apart. Southerners, of course, saw John Brown as a dangerous fanatic, really a terrorist who deserved death. Um, Northerners, however, many Northerners were sympathetic to Brown and his um, crusade, and some Northerners began to see Brown as a martyr to the anti-slavery um, cause. And uh, there was even a song, someone wrote a little song uh, about John Brown <clears throat> that became popular in the North, and if you'll forgive me, I'm going to sing a few bars here. John Brown's body lies a-molding in the grave. John Brown's body lies a-molding in the grave. John Brown's body lies a molding in the grave. His truth is marching on. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you for staying with me on that. Yeah, uh, anyway, that that's uh, a catchy song. And, and as you probably know later, Julia Ward Howe uh, turned that tune into uh, the song we call the Battle Hymn of the Republic with its refrain of glory, glory, um, hallelujah. Um, well, anyway, uh, the nation was sliding towards uh, a violent solution to the ongoing problem of slavery. And um, really what <sighs> led immediately to the Civil War was simply the outcome of the election of 1860. Now, this was a very unusual presidential election. Uh, there were four major candidates. Uh, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln did win the Republican nomination. The Democratic Party split in half. Um, Southern Democrats had their own convention and they nominated John C. Breckinridge, the vice president from Kentucky. Um, Stephen Douglas, uh, Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois, became the nominee of the northern half of the Democratic Party. And then there was a the fourth candidate, John Bell, from the uh, short-lived Constitutional Union um, Party. Um, whose platform was simply to keep the Union together uh, at all costs. Uh, and when the votes were counted, um, you see here that Abraham Lincoln only won 39.9% of the popular votes. You see also Lincoln's uh, states being in red and Breckinridge's in purple. You see uh, the stark division between North and South and just how polarized these two sections of the country had become uh, with the other two candidates uh, winning a few states here and there in the border areas. But because the Northern states by this time were so much more heavily populated than the Southern states, um, Lincoln, in spite of winning less than 40% of the popular vote, managed to win a majority in the Electoral College and therefore um, he was elected. And uh, almost immediately, um, southern states took alarm at this because they believed um, if Lincoln entered the White House that he would take steps to eliminate slavery entirely, although Lincoln himself had never, uh, ever um, said that that was part of his plan. Uh, still, Southerners believed that, uh, that, that Lincoln and the Republicans would do that. And so one by one, during that winter after the presidential election of, of 1860, um, Southern states began to secede, that is, to leave um, the United States of America. You see here on the map, beginning with South Carolina, as usual, the ringleader um, in these uh, issues about slavery. Um, South Carolina was the first to secede, followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama. Georgia was the fifth state to secede, 
uh, than Louisiana and Texas during this secession winter of 1860 to 1861. And so you see that um, the real reason that the states, these first seven states seceded, um, had entirely to do, solely to do with the presidential election, with Lincoln's election. No shots had been fired yet. Uh, no armies were in the field. Um, it was solely because of the results of the presidential election that these seven states seceded. And uh, they met uh, at Montgomery, Alabama and formed very quickly a new Confederate States of America, the CSA, the Confederacy, uh, wrote up a constitution and elected Jefferson Davis of Mississippi as their uh, president. And so the stage was set for the outbreak of the Great Civil War.